Well, we've been in this series called Reset, hitting the reset button on so many parts of our life. We've been in the book of 1 Corinthians, and today we continue on with that. But before we jump into the text, I have a question for you. And here it is. You have any conflict going on right now? Yeah, you do, don't you? You do. There's some faces that come to mind, some faces that you don't want to run into in the grocery store, a few friendships that have soured. You got some exes. You got some bad deals. You got some awkward situations. You got some work drama. Some of us had conflict right before signing on to church, didn't we? You know who you are. I know how it goes. Relation, relational conflict is very, very common. Check this out. A recent, uh, recent poll showed this, that 60% of people last year, upwards of 60% of people on Facebook unfriended someone solely based on politics. 60%. And that's just for politics. You add in the other reasons and this, this percentage just shoots up. Now, life isn't, of course, life is not about social media, but it is an indicator. We got a lot of social conflict going on right now. And when we talk about this word right here, when we talk about conflict, and call it whatever you want, you know, disagreements, unhealthy relationships, feuding, when we look at this question right here, it might even trigger some anger, some pain, because relationships, you know this, relationships that go bad, they hurt. Maybe you've been betrayed. Maybe you got burned really badly. Maybe you're gossiped about. Maybe an ex won custody. Maybe you lost a lot of money. Some really big things come to mind when we, when we look at this. And so you probably don't even want to go here. You're thinking, Gina, do we really have to talk about this? Can we just forget about, the, about our conflict? Even though we won't forget about our conflict, can we just try to forget about it? Why do we have to talk about this? Because God brings it up. And as painful as it may be, God wants you to hit that reset button on your conflict and gain a fresh perspective and maybe some more sanity while we're at it. You need this. We need this. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is where we find ourselves today. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Really encourage you to grab a Bible wherever you're at. Maybe it's on a nightstand or maybe it's on a, a table or maybe it's on a bookshelf. Well, go ahead and grab that Bible right now. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is where we're at. We're not going to hit the whole chapter today, just the first half of it. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, this chapter that we're looking at today was written to a church who had a lot of infighting going on. Church fighting is always very, very ugly. And churches fight about the weirdest, weirdest stuff. I mean, if it, if it weren't so bad, it could, be, it could make a, a good TV show. I've seen churches fight over the color of carpet. I, I saw a church split over the color of their carpet when they were doing renovations. Just awful. Uh, churches have split over chairs versus pews. Churches have split over music. Churches fight. It's really sad, but they fight. And the church that we're going to be studying today in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 had several fights going on. A lot of church drama. And Paul, who started this church, introduced everybody to each other. Paul is about to confront the conflict. So here's the plan. We're just going to dive right into this church drama. We're going to get into this church soap opera, so to speak, kind of get a feel for what's going on here. And then once we get through the text, we'll come out of it with some principles that help us today as, as we handle our conflict. But first, let me pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. And God, I, I thank you that you care enough to write this to us. I thank you that this is practical, that even though this is ancient literature, it is so timeless. And God, this, this has the potential, today has the potential to really change a lot of our homes, a lot of our marriages, a lot of our dating relationships, friendships. Uh, this, th this is huge for so many of us. I pray that none of us miss it. You will speak, God. I ask that we listen. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as the lens of Scripture zooms in on 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we enter a place that we've been in for six weeks now. We've been in the city of Corinth. It's a familiar place. It's, it's, it's very familiar now. The, the bustling harbor that's filled with sailors and boats, it's, it's familiar to us. The, the markets that sell fresh ingredients for, for Greek food, we love that. We're, we're starting to find out which parts of the city, the seedy parts of the city that we need to avoid. Today, though, we find ourselves somewhere new. See, around the corner from the market, just down the street, sits a government building, and oh, we've passed it many times on our way to the market. We never really gave it much thought. Just a typical Roman-style building. But today we stop and we walk inside. It's near impossible to get much beyond the door. A small crowd fills the seating area. And not just any small crowd. These are church people. They're pointing fingers at each other. They're making accusations. They're demanding money from each other. They're giving testimonies. And 
The government officials are quickly trying to, to bring some order to, to what's going on here. Finally, the chaos calms down enough for a, for a few church members to present their case against a few other church members. This is simply a hearing, but it's an entertaining one at that. Litigation in this society was very entertaining. People would come and they would watch these court cases go down, uh, just like we do today. We watch Judge Judy. That's what they had going on during this time. Only the way these courts operated, it was a lot like Jerry Springer marries Judge Judy, which is just a nightmare if you think about it, but that's what's going on here. It's chaos mixed with formal rulings, and the church is at center stage. And there's more hearings to come, but for now, the church crowd is dismissed, and they quietly walk out of the building. They will gather again in a few days, though not in the court building, but in church. And when they gather together in church, after being in court that week, they sit down and they read these words from Paul, who introduced them to each other. Paul writes this, when one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Now, the, the word grievance here could also be translated as lawsuit. We're talking civil lawsuit, and this is very important. Paul is not talking about criminal law. Uh, these, those are two very different uh, conversations. If you are assaulted, Christians are free to press charges, and they should. In verse 4, though, if you look at verse 4 in your Bible, in the middle of verse 4, it says trivial matters, which makes a big difference as to how we approach the reading of this passage. We're not talking about crime today. We're talking about civil lawsuits. Really what we're talking about is one Christian suing another Christian. Paul is talking about civil law. Likely what's happening in this church is they're doing business together. Business deals, partnerships in the church, and that's great. Christians should do business with other Christians. Uh, my mechanic comes from the bridge. I trust him. My barber goes to the bridge. Uh, our attorney for home sales and our will is from the bridge. My, my, uh, my kid's doctor goes to the bridge. Our HVAC goes to the bridge. Our plumber goes to the bridge. All bridge people. And not because I want to get a deal. I don't. I want to support someone's business in our church, and I want to go to somebody I trust, and so I'll even pay more to do that. It's great, but it can get tricky, even sticky when this happens, and maybe this has happened to you. What happens when they don't fulfill their end of the deal? What happens if I don't pay? What if I don't fulfill my end of the deal? What happens if I get screwed over? And this has happened in the way past. What happens if somebody you worship with in the church doesn't fulfill their end of the deal? What do you do? Well, the church in Corinth would say, sue him, take him to court, make him pay. Don't you dare be taken advantage of. Take it before a judge and, and, and make him pay. Yet Paul says something very different here. He says, why would you go to some unbelieving judge? Yes, they know law, but they're unbelieving. Why would you go to some unbelieving judge who doesn't know what's right in, in the eyes of God? Roman, Roman judges, they don't, they don't care about God. So, so why is God's family going to a Roman judge outside of the family to settle family squabbles? He says here, ought you not to take it to, to a saint? Go to a saint instead of a judge. And we're looking at that going, a saint? Aren't, like, aren't, aren't saints the, the, the dead guys? When scripture uses this word saint, it just means believer. It means follower of Jesus. So if you're a believer, you're a saint. Welcome, welcome to sainthood. If Joe the plumber loves Jesus and follows Jesus, he's Saint Joe, patron saint of plumbers. And Paul is saying here, why are you taking these family matters to the unbelievers, the, the government bureaucrats down the street? If you love Jesus, if they love Jesus, why not get another saint involved, maybe Joe the plumber, get another saint or two involved to settle the family matter? If you have the mind of Christ... You have the maturity to figure this out. Maybe get a couple other saints involved. Civil lawsuits. Paul says that's for the rest of the world. Do you know that over 40 million civil lawsuits were filed last year? 40 million. If it weren't for lawyers, we wouldn't need lawyers. I had to get a lawyer joke in there, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm totally kidding, by the way. I have good friends. We have great lawyers in our church. Um, a lot of my family members are lawyers. I just had to slip in a little lawyer joke there. But did you know that the United States has more lawyers, and this is serious, more lawyers per capita than any other country? Our society spends twice as much on civil litigation than it does on, the autom on, on automobiles. So civil litigation is a bigger industry than the automobile industry. 
If you want some time to kill, just Google dumb lawsuits. They're hilarious. Actually, don't do that now. Um, probably should have said that after the sermon. But they are hilarious. I mean, the things that people sue over. Red Bull is being sued right now because it doesn't actually give you wings. Apparently, somebody thought that's worth suing over. Why didn't Red Bull give me wings? A family was sued a while back because a burglar got stuck in their garage, was stuck in there. Once he got out, he sued the family. The burglar sued the family. Or this week, did you see uh, this week the, the Gorilla Glue girl in the news? Uh, big thing in the news right now. She ran out of hair product, and she put Gorilla Glue in her hair, and it has been there for weeks. She went to the ER. A poor girl. Can't, get it, can't even get it out even after being in the ER. But now she's suing Gorilla Glue. It, it, it's out of control. Even for Christians, it's estimated that churchgoers file, on average, 10 to 12 million lawsuits a year. So out of the 40 million lawsuits a year, Christians make up about a quarter of it, if not more. As some attorneys and judges have commented that they see no difference between Christians and non-Christians in a courtroom setting. This is exactly what Paul was addressing here. We continue on to verse 2. He says, do you not know, don't you know, that the saints, you, if you believe in Jesus Christ, will judge the world? What does that mean? I'm going to judge the world? Is that actually right? Yeah. Jesus talked about this. Uh, Daniel talked about this as well. It's in Revelation. Uh, reality is, in the new world, in the next life, Christians will be judges under the leadership of Jesus. We will judge the world. And, and really the word judge here means to govern or to rule over. Our life right now, how we live our life right now, it determines how much we will govern in the next life. But we will, we will be judges, which is like a crazy thought. But it even gets more trippy than that because if you look at the beginning of, of verse 3, it gets even crazier. Look at this. Do you, so do you not know that you will judge the world? Do you not know that you are to judge angels? No, I didn't know that. Are you serious? We're going to judge angels? How B.A. is that? Take that, Judge Judy. I'm going to judge some angels. What, what does this mean? Judge angels. Well, humans, us, we are created in the image of God. Angels are not. On top of that, Christians are redeemed by God. Angels are not. So we have a higher standing, a standing position than the angels do. And that's a pretty wild thought, isn't it? But it's true. In fact, the, the, in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews tells us that the angels are sent to serve the followers of Jesus Christ. You think about it, a big thing today is, uh, you know, when somebody dies, we like to say something like, you know, well, they're an angel now, which is a really nice thought. We, we like to think that. But if they were a believer, uh, it's way better than that. They're governing angels right now. We will govern, we will judge angels. That's a, that's a fascinating thought. Maybe it's a new thought for you. It's a fascinating thought, but don't get distracted by this. The, the point that Paul is making is this. You have way more wisdom than you realize because you have the mind of Christ. You have the Holy Spirit living within you and guiding you and giving you wisdom. You should be able to navigate these trivial little squabbles. One day, you will be making some really heavy calls. Don't you think you should figure out some of the conflict that you find yourself in? Paul says you're better than that. It's like uh, one of my high school basketball scrimmages. I had to guard this guy on the basketball team, and uh, he was a starter. I was not. He was the quarterback of the football team, the star quarterback. He was, you know, the homecoming king, basketball star, had, had scholarship offers from other colleges for football. He was also quite a bully. And I was the new guy on the team. It was my first year at this school. I was new. And during scrimmage, I was guarding him, and I was beating him. And he was getting frustrated. He was talking smack, you know, just like guys do sometimes. But at one point, he intentionally threw his elbow, and he hit me in the face, and then I got this bloody nose. And so I threw a fist back. So I got his nose bleeding too. And you picture this, both teams are on one side of the court, and then you have two idiots on the other side of the court just pounding on each other. And then the whistles started blowing, and the coaches were separating us. They wouldn't even let us clean ourselves up. They just told us to run the next pra for, for the rest of the practice as our nose were just bleeding all over our jerseys. And at the end of practice, the head coach sat us both down, and he stuck his finger in our face, and he says, you're better than that. The truth is, I wasn't. I was still mad they broke up the fight. But what was my coach doing? 
He was calling us to a higher level. And that's exactly what Paul is doing right here. He's saying you're, you're fighting over stupid things that, 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 that were trivial right there in the middle of the verse. Trivial, little, stupid things that don't even matter. This is a, this is a scrimmage. You're better than that. Don't you know you're going to judge the world? You will judge angels. And you can't even figure this out right here? You're better than that. I continue on in verse 4. So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? You can see Paul's love for the church here. So the, the, the church should be able to handle these things. I say this to your shame. Can it be that there's no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute among the brothers? You should be ashamed of the way you're fighting right now. Your first step as future judges of the world, future judges of the angels... Your first step should be getting together and having the maturity and the wisdom to figure this out. And if it doesn't work, then you get a third party involved, someone outside but a saint to help you navigate this. I'm not saying you will never find your way into court, but come on, that should be the last option, not the first. Figure this out together. He says, but brothers, brother goes, goes to law against brother, and that before an unbeliever? Again, civil court cases were, were a source of entertainment. People would come and they would observe the, the drama that would go down in the courtroom. The church in Corinth is showing the rest of the community they don't have the wisdom, they don't have the maturity to figure this out on their own. There's a big black eye on the church. So you have people watching all of this going down thinking, oh, they say they have God living in them, but look at them. They're just as petty as everybody else who lives here. Paul says you're so concerned about winning, but to have lawsuits at all with one another is already defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? You're so concerned about losing a case you already lost. Take an elbow to the face and turn the other cheek like Jesus told you to do. But you throwing a fist back and trying to win this fight is just making you lose. Now, Obviously, there's a line. It's, it's really easy to look at this and be like, okay, but there has to be a line here, right? Yes, there's a line here. Paul isn't saying never seek justice. I mean, we serve a God of justice. What he's saying is once in a while, be okay with an elbow. But sometimes you got to do something. Like, think about it. If I hired a, a contractor to put a roof on my house, and I paid him in full up front, and, uh, and, and he took my roof off, but weeks later, there's no roof on my house, and he refuses to do anything, well, then I have to do something. If he's not a Christian and he refuses to do anything, I probably got to get the court involved because I need a roof. If the guy's a Christian, well, okay, then I'm going to try to figure this out with him, maybe get a couple other Christians involved. If he goes to a church, maybe get that church involved, maybe get a Christian organization that specializes in resolutions involved. But if there's still no roof on my house, last resort, I got to go to court. I got to get a roof on my house. But let's say, let's say, let's say you come to the bridge, you're in person. And out in the parking lot, you accidentally back up into my truck. Now I got a dent in my truck. And you and I, we can't come to a resolution. You can't pay for it, or you can't pay much for it. As a believer, I have an obligation to be okay with an elbow. I can afford an elbow here. Eh, it sucks, but it was an accident. It is what it is. And so I'll just live with the dent, or I'll take care of the dent myself. This is what Paul's saying here is this is very situational. And, and Paul knows this is very situational. He's trying to get the church to think differently. Because the church's first reaction with anything was, oh, we got to go to court. And Paul's saying, no, 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 no. Sometimes for the sake of the church, sometimes for the sake of the kingdom of God, sometimes for the sake of your relationship, just take an elbow if you can't afford it. And then keep going. This is very much case by case. A big court fight isn't the only option, and it certainly shouldn't be the first option, especially between Christians. Uh, verse 8, if you have in your Bibles, verse 8 says, you're not innocent. You're not innocent. Some of you, 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 you yourselves are wrong. So stop playing the victim. You do the same things to other people that other people do to you. And then look in your Bibles, verses 9 through 10 uh, Paul gives this long list of people who are outside of the church. You see that long list right there in verses 9 and 10? Uh, he says idolaters, he says adulterers, he says thieves, he says drunkards. You'll see the word homosexuals in there, which is like this big buzzword, and now we want to talk about that. You know, that takes us somewhere else. Okay, we'll talk about that more next week when we talk about sex. All right, so uh, we're, next week is reset your sex. 
And some of you are like, I am not signing on for that. We're talking about sex. Okay, don't be a prude. We're not going to have visuals. You, you, should, you should sign on for that. Others of you are like, babe, we are signing on next week. We're talking about sex. Uh, again, we'll get to all of that next week. Uh, anyway, so Paul gives this list in verses 9 and 10. You know, thieves, drunkards, sex addicts, idolaters. And then in verse 12, he again says, you're better than that. Or verse 11, he again says, you're better than that. So like, look at verse 11. I'll pull it up here. Verse 11 says, as such were some of you. So idolaters and, 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 and sex addicts and swindlers, you were some of those. But you were washed of all that. You were sanctified, matured. We've already talked about that word in the series. You were justified. Justified means just as if I never sinned. You were made right before God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. The constant fighting. That's for everybody outside the church. The bickering is for the drunks and the thieves. Church, you're better than that. You were washed of all of that. You were matured beyond all of that. You were made right with God. So show it. Act like it. Show some class, church. You're to be different. And this is a, this is a constant theme throughout 1 Corinthians. And really throughout Scripture. You're to be different. If you call yourself a believer, you're to be different. The way you handle yourself in relationships, the way you handle yourself in friendships, the way you handle yourself at work, the way you handle yourself online, it's to be different. The fighting, the bickering, the bullying, the gossip, the competition, that's for everybody else. The drunkards, the swindlers, the greedy people. We're different. How we approach conflict, it's going to be different. Problem is, we're not always different, are we? This is a struggle for us, isn't it? So let's get really practical. Let's hit the reset button and walk out of here with a plan. Five things we get from this passage. Here we go. Five things. Number one, write these down. Don't expect the majority to agree with you. Some of us have got to stop expecting the majority to agree with us. And now this isn't explicitly in the text, but it is implicit. Paul says we're different. Because of Jesus Christ, we are sanctified. We have the mind of Christ the world, the majority culture, is not going to agree with us. And that's okay. The world shouldn't agree with us. If you find yourself agreeing, having the same opinion with the majority, you got to ask yourself, are you really on the narrow path then? If the majority agrees with you, are you really on the narrow path? Are you really in the kingdom of God? We got to stop expecting people to agree with us. I made a mistake. I should not have done this. I made a mistake a while back of uh, going on Twitter just scrolling, I was bored, you know, scrolling through forums. Five minutes later, I was getting angry. I mean, there's just a lot of, there's a lot of stupid people in this world who are very vocal and passionate about their very stupid opinions. And so I was getting angry. I was like, how can I think that? This is so unfair. That is so untrue. And I'm like working myself up. You've never done that, have you? No, not at all. Uh, it took the Holy Spirit in that moment to remind me, all of these people are lost, Junior. Why would they agree with you? Why should they agree with you? Twitter is pretty much all they got. Don't expect the majority to agree with you. Actually, let's take this a step further, because we should. Don't expect anyone to agree with you. Expecting someone to agree with you is just setting yourself up to be offended. And then the conflict starts, because they don't have the opinion that they should have, because it's your opinion, and they should have the same opinion as you, because it just makes sense. Your opinion is just that. It's just an opinion. And the anger that we feel when people disagree with us it's an indicator of our pride, and that leads to conflict. Just expect people are going to disagree with you, and that's okay. It's not your job to change your mind. Do yourself a favor and just expect nobody's going to agree with me, and then you'll just set yourself up to be pleasantly surprised, surprised when somebody does agree with you. Number two, number two, get good at settling conflict. I mean, that's, that's, very, that's very explicit in the text, right? He says, the world will be judged by you. Angels will be judged by you. I mean, if that's true, and we better get good at settling conflict. We should be people who other people go to to help resolve conflict. But we will not be those people if we got a bunch of fights going on ourselves. Settle your fights. Settle them. Get really good at it. See, we know this. There's two different types of people. There's people who instigate conflict, and there's people who run from conflict. And all of us are somewhere on that spectrum. So this should challenge all of us. If you're somebody who avoids conflict, you know, sweeps it under the rug, avoid necessary conversations, you know, you, you, listen, you're just making the conflict worse. So saddle up, walk toward the conflict, and resolve it. Now, if you're somebody on the other side of the spectrum, 
You like to instigate the conflict. You know, you find yourself fighting online a lot, a lot of passive-aggressive comments. You find yourself talking to people and trying to get people to side with you. Knock it off. Knock it off. You're stoking the fire. Stop trying to win. Paul says you've already lost if that's you. So get good at solving conflict. Resolve it. Stop instigating it. Christians, we should be people who have the healthiest homes, the healthiest marriages, the healthiest friendships, the healthiest relationships, because we are a people who are just good at settling conflict. Through the Holy Spirit, we have the courage to approach the conflict, and we have the wisdom to settle it, because we are future judges of the world. Sub point to this. Choose your battles. Choose your battles. Not everything is worth fighting over. Not everything is worth fighting over. Some things are, but not everything. I love it. Proverbs 20, verse 3 says, I love this. It says, it is an honor for a man to keep aloof from strife, but every fool will be quarreling. I love this. It is an honor for a man to keep aloof. You know what that word aloof also translates as Sabbath or Shabbat, Sabbath. It's like, it's like he's saying, say, I'm taking a Sabbath from this conflict. You're trying to start a fight with me? Hey, I'm taking a Sabbath from that. Not worth fighting over, so I'm taking a Sabbath. Save your chips for the battles that matter. Save your chips for the conversations that you need to have. Save it for when it matters. Because there are disagreements that matter. And they need to be settled. But when you're fighting over everything, you're far less effective when it really does matter. Number three. Third thing from this text. Sometimes you have to take a punch and move on. Sometimes you got to take a punch and move on. Paul says, why not suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? Unlike me, sometimes you just got to take an elbow to the face and keep on playing. Problem is, and this is, this is me and the scrimmage court, our pride gets in the way. We think, oh, they can't think that. They can't do that to me and get away with it. We start blooding each other up, and then the name of Jesus gets a black eye. And just like my basketball coach sitting us down after practice, I wonder how many of us Jesus wants to sit down and say, you are better than that. You're better than that. So knock it off. Do you really want to be defined by always being right and getting what's yours? Is that really how you want to live your life? Or do you want to, you want to follow Jesus and turn the other cheek? Is your reputation, is your social media timeline, is your name, are you known for your fight? Or are you known for your following? Sometimes you just got to take an elbow and move on. Some of us have conflict that we've been holding on for far too long. The conflict happened decades ago, and we're still holding on to it like it happened this morning. It's messing with us mentally. It's tangled up in our ego. We can't get over it. And the Holy Spirit is nudging you, hey, you're better than that. You're better than that. Just take the elbow and move on. Number four, don't play the victim. Don't play the victim. Paul says, you yourselves are wrong. So stop acting like you're always the victim. And this is a, this is a big thing for us today in 2021. We're, we're hurt very easily today. And a lot of it is because our pride is just too big and it gets bumped far too easily. And when it does get bumped, oh, we're the victim, we're wrong, nobody understands me. And it becomes this vicious cycle where we push people away. I was reading an article this week by a psychologist and he wrote this. He wrote, people who act like the victims tend to push people away. And then they play the victim even more now because nobody likes me, everybody's against me, and so they're pushing away people even more. The article is all about how people who play victims tend to be frozen in life. Do you know anybody like that? Just frozen in life. Yikes. Paul says, don't do that. You've played a part in the situations. Take responsibility where you can. Be okay with an elbow. Move on. Number five. Fifth thing. Handle yourself with class. Handle yourself with class. Verse 11 says, You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. So have some class. Child of the Most High, have some class. The conflict of this world, the squabbles of, of, of swindlers, the politics, the mudslinging, and the big egos, and the victimizing, you were washed of all of that. You were matured beyond that. You are better than that. So handle yourself with some class. You will judge the world. You will judge angels. Carry yourself as one who will. Followers of Jesus should be the most unoffendable people. People should look at us and wonder, how do they do it? 
Offenses seem to roll off them. You can't get under their skin. They can take a punch and move on and turn the other cheek. How do they do it? Because this isn't about us. It's not about us. We have the mind of Christ, and we follow one who really knew how to take a punch and then change the world. Reset your conflict. You got to do it. And let me say this. It, it's pretty easy to preach this stuff. It's just all right here. It's really easy to preach this stuff, actually. It's really hard to live it, though. It, it, can, be, it can be pretty easy for me to stand up here, you know, and unpack these words and draw out some application and look like I got this down, you know, because I'm teaching it. You know, oh, hey, turn the other cheek. And, you know, it's, it's easy to get, sometimes look, look like a rock star pastor. You know, just kind of step up to the plate and hit a home run and, all right, you turn the other cheek. Uh, see you later. Just so you know, this is a really big struggle for me. In many ways, I've, I've got that flesh part of me still that I had on the basketball court. If I get an elbow, I want to throw a fist. I spent much of 2020 chewing my tongue off, seeing blog posts and social media comments and taking them really personally and writing up some sort of response that punches back only to delete it. You know, hear something through the grapevine from somebody, you know, someone said this about you, Junior. It's like, well, let me tell you about them. My stupid, immature pride. Just like you, I've got faces. I've got names that are really hard for me to turn the other cheek with. I, I want to fight back. They're throwing elbows. I got things to say. I got my side, and I got dirt on them. I sometimes don't want to be better than that. I have a rock sitting on my uh, nightstand next to my bed that has Matthew 5.44 written on it in a sharpie. It says, I'll bless those who curse you. And it sits there because this is really hard for me. I don't want to bless. I don't want to turn the other cheek. I want to fight back. And I bet you do too. I think this is hard for everybody. It's a, to be better than the world's way of fighting, to choose your battles, to shrug off the trivial stuff, to just take a punch and, and move on. I mean, come on, that, that's not easy. That's much easier said than done. We do this because our big brother, Jesus, did it. Not because it's easy. Because Jesus did it. And we're able to do the same thing because we trust, we know. God has our back. And it may be hard right now, and it may hurt right now, but make no mistake, Jesus is coming back. And every lie will be undone, every fight will be torn apart, every injustice will be tried, every tear will be wiped. We are headed there. And as we're on our way, we choose our battles, taking a punch and counting it joy, refusing to play the victim, handling ourselves with some class. The trivial drama of this world, the politics, the mudslinging, Christian you are better than that. So the question becomes, so what? Where are you at with this? Because some faces came to mind. A situation came to mind. A couple of situations came to mind. You got some conflict. How are you doing with it? Have you gotten sucked into the mudslinging and the victimizing and the trivial squabbles? Is Paul talking to you? Because he's talking to me. I think he's talking to you too. Have you taken an elbow and thrown a fist right back? You know, we come out of God's word with a question, and here's the question that I want to throw to you before you sign off. Here's the question. What does resetting your conflict look like? You have conflict, and the Holy Spirit, through God's word, is telling you you've got to reset it. You have to change your approach to your conflict. It might be marital conflict. It might be a business relationship conflict. It might be some dating conflict. It could be drama in the family. It could be political. It could be online. But you have some conflict. In fact, you probably have a lot of conflict because here we are in 2021. We just got a 2020. We got a lot of conflict. What is resetting for you going to look like? Is it going to look like an elbow and moving on? Is it going to look like having a conversation saying, I got to stop running from this and I have to have that conversation? Is it going to look like forgiveness? Is it going to look like asking for forgiveness? What is resetting your conflict going to look like for you? Oh, I urge you, do this. It could change your life. Father, we thank you so much that you forgive us. And we thank you that 
Paul addresses something that we are not so great at, handling conflict. 2,000 years ago, uh, Paul is lecturing the church about how they're handling conflict, and we're feeling it today because we're not great at this. God, I thank you that you are a forgiving God, that you are a loving God, and that you push us. You're better than that. We thank you for those words. God, may you continually remind us of that throughout this week. And may we hit that reset button. May we resolve our conflicts and get really good at resolving future conflicts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.